I grew up in East Point, Georgia. That's the south side of Atlanta. And our neighborhood, our house where I grew up, was right across the street from a small public park. And every day when I got home from school, I would want to go to the park. As soon as I could get my homework done, I was ready to go to the park. We had dinner about every night from five, between 5.30 and 6, and everybody had to be back home for dinner, and everybody knew that. So I'd go to the park and play. I often lose track of time. My dad got home from work every day about 5.30, and it was just a routine. We had family dinner together. And if I wasn't home at 5.30, my dad would just go to the front porch and whistle. And he had the loudest whistle I have ever heard. And then I'd hear my name, David, get home. It's time for supper. And if I was too busy playing, I didn't hear him. One of my friends heard him and said, you better get home. Your dad's calling. God anoints parents with an extra powerful voice to call their kids. You know, God's a lot like that. When God wants us somewhere doing something, he calls us. When Adam and Eve sinned against God in the garden, he called them back into fellowship with him. God called Noah to build an ark to save his family in the days of the great flood. God called Abraham out of the Chaldean culture to go to a land of Canaan, a promised land to bring forth a great nation. God called Moses at a burning bush to deliver Israel from Egyptian bondage. God called Deborah to be a leader and judge to defend Israel in the day of battle. God called young David to be a faithful king, a man after his own heart. God called Isaiah to bring the word of the Lord to his generation. In a vision, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Then he heard the voice of the Lord, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, Lord, send me. God called Mary to be a vessel through whom the Son of God, Jesus, was born into the world. Jesus walked the shores of Galilee and through towns meeting people, and he called men to be the apostles of his new kingdom. And today the Holy Spirit moves throughout the world calling people to faith and repentance and salvation through Jesus Christ. You and I are born again. We know Jesus as our Savior because God called us, not because we pursued God, but because God pursued us. We responded to the call of God. We heard the voice of God. We heard the voice of the Lord calling us to salvation. And the moment we put our faith in Jesus, we have a call also to service and ministry. God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. God has a calling on your life. And your best life is lived when you awaken to that calling and you live in that calling. The Bible says a lot to us about the calling of God on our lives. In Romans 1 and 6, it says we're called to belong to Christ Jesus. The moment we accept him, we are called to belong. We're not isolated. And you know, when we belong to the Lord, we belong to each other. Turn to somebody and say, we're family. We not only belong to him, we belong to each other. The word says in Romans 8 and 28 that we're called according to his good purpose. In Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, that the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. In 1 Corinthians 1, 9, we read, God who called you into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ, is faithful. The word tells us in Ephesians 4 and 1, walk worthy of the calling you have received. In Philippians 3 and 14, press on for the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, we read that God has called us to a holy life. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, God who called you is faithful and he will do it. Peter said in 1 Peter 2 and 9, you're called out of darkness into his wonderful light. And finally, Peter says in 2 Peter 1 and 10, make your calling and election sure. And that's my encouragement today. I want you to make your calling and election sure. I want you to know that you're called of God to live in that calling because that is where your best life is. And sometimes we don't want God to call us. We don't feel like we qualify or the, the idea that we're called of God can be intimidating to all of us or it's kind of like, you know, when you went to high school or college, I used to be this way. I'd go into some classes and I wanted to be anonymous. So I'd go to the back and sit and I would tell myself, don't open your big mouth. Don't even be noticed. You know, this science class is going to be difficult or this math class. I want the teacher calling on you in this class. So I'd go to the back and try to be anonymous. And eventually I made the mistake of, you know, opening my mouth and, you know, eventually the teacher knew who I was. And sometimes it's like that with the call of God. You just kind of want God to almost not notice that we're there because we don't feel like we can live up to a calling. 
It was a story I heard about a man who had just turned 100, and all his friends and his family had a big celebration for him, and he was a faithful member of the church. Of a church. He'd been there all his life, and he was in church every Sunday. This man never missed, was so faithful. When he had his 100th birthday, he stopped going to church altogether, and after about a month, the pastor noticed he wasn't in church, and so he decided to visit him to see if it was okay. And he said, I just stopped by to see you today. I haven't seen you in church. You're always in church. You've never missed services. Is there, is there any reason you stopped coming to church? He said, you know, Pastor, when I turned 90, I thought for sure the Lord would take me to heaven, but he didn't. And then when I turned 95, I knew for sure he would take me to heaven, but he didn't. And now that I've turned to 100, I figured he doesn't notice me anymore, and I'm not going back to church to remind him I'm still here. But whether we want to remain anonymous in the kingdom of God or not, there is a calling on our lives, and God notices where we are, and Christ is calling us. And that calling at times has challenges for us to fulfill our destiny and for us to fulfill our purpose. And that was the experience of Jeremiah the prophet who had a great calling, a clear calling, but he went through a lot of difficulty. And today I want to share some important truths about the calling of God and living out your calling from Jeremiah's experience. He got very discouraged at one point, even to the point that he wanted to quit because his calling was not working out the way that he thought it would. It was not going as easy as he thought it would go. And so in Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 11, in this prayer, he pours out his feelings to God. He pours out his complaint to God about his calling. He pours out his struggle to God about his calling. And he begins this way in prayer. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak in his name anymore, his word is in my heart. Say that with me. His word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. And then he restores his confidence. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will not prevail. There's some interesting insights about the calling of God and the journey all of us go through to fulfill God's calling. And the first thing that Jeremiah came to terms with was the cost of God's calling. There's a cost to discipleship. There's a cost to doing the will of God. And he came to terms with that. And that's what he means when he opens in this prayer and he says, you deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. And that's about as strong as you could talk to God. He is really exasperated with the fact that his life is not turning out the way he thought it would, and it's not as easy as he thought it would, so much so that he refers to the call of God on his life as divine deception. That word deceived in the Hebrew can also be translated, you persuaded me. Does God override our will? No, but God puts so much pressure on the human will that it is very difficult to not submit to him. And that's what he felt. He felt the pressure of grace, the irresistible will of God, that God had deceived him and misled him. What he's saying is if I had known that answering your call was going to lead to a life like this, I would have never responded. You misled me. I didn't know that this was involved. I don't know this challenge was involved. I didn't know that there'd be this difficulty. I don't know I was going to have to pay this kind of price. I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm preaching your word to your people. I'm ridiculed. I'm mocked. People aren't listening. The king of Israel didn't listen. He had the wrong political alliances. If you read the book of Jeremiah, the priests should have become corrupt. Only rituals only. The prophets were no longer telling people the truth. In fact, God confronts the prophets through Jeremiah that they were just washing over the issues. They were preaching peace and safety. They weren't dealing with the real issues of their times. The politicians had become corrupt in his day. And here he was calling people back to God and back to faith and telling them they don't need to follow idols or trust in their might and their power. And people weren't listening for the most part. The king wasn't listening. They locked him up in prison several times so they didn't have to listen to him. 
And he said, you deceived me. I didn't know it was going to cost this much. And the calling of God will cost all of us. It will cost you something to fulfill your calling. It won't come easy. Your education is going to cost you something. Getting married is going to cost you something, especially on anniversaries. <laughs> having children, people act like just having a baby is just something vogue. Like I want to have a baby. Bringing a child of the world is extremely costly. There's a tremendous cost that parents have to pay to really devote their lives to their children. Starting a business will cost you. Going into the ministry will cost you. Going into missions will cost you. Pursuing your career, athletics will cost you. There's a cost to fulfill our calling. But let me tell you something. If we will count the cost and pay the price, we will reap the reward. And Jesus talked about this in discipleship, Luke chapter 14, verse 20. If anyone wants to build a building, doesn't he first sit down and count the cost to see if he has enough money to finish? Now, we're living in a time that's making us soft. We're living in a culture now that's conditioning us to look for the easy way. But nothing great can ever be accomplished or achieved easily. The easy road hasn't been paved yet. If you're looking for it, it hasn't even been paved yet. There is no easy road in this life, at least not to greatness and to significance. The calling of God has a cost. But if we will count the cost and pay the price, we'll reap the reward. If you will devote yourself to the call of God, you'll receive such benefits and blessings from God. And we're being conditioned today to just take it easy. Everything's going to come easy. Politicians are offering us free income, free, co free everything. But we're being conditioned. Our children are being conditioned with no work ethic, no drive, no initiative. It's all going to come easy. It's not going to come easy. It's not going to come easy. That's an illusion. It's a fantasy. It's not. If you're going to make it in life, you're going to have to make it on your own. The government is not going to provide for you. People aren't going to take care of you. You've got to have a fire within your own heart. You've got to set your goal. You've got to answer your calling. And you've got to pay the price. Don't let people falsely mislead you into a life that will never be there. God created you to dream and to build and to pursue. There's a God-created greatness within you. You count the cost, you pay the price, and you will reap the reward. And Jeremiah struggled with that, and he finally came to terms with it. And if you will make the cost and... Follow the Lord's will in your life. God will bless you. Now, Peter, the apostle, they'd give up their fishing business for Jesus. But he said to Jesus one time in Mark chapter 10, verse 28 through 30, he said, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. And they had. But Jesus said, Peter, I'll tell you the truth. No one has left his home or his family or his business for me and the gospel who will not fail to receive a hundred times as much in this life and in the life to come everlasting life. So when the way gets difficult and you feel like quitting, don't quit. You feel like bailing. You feel like trying to find something easier. Don't do that to yourself. Count the cost. Pay the price. You'll reap the reward. And that's what Jeremiah learned. He had to grow through this feeling. He had to get past the illusion that just because he was in the call of God, everything was going to happen easily for him. He finally got through that. And that's why he went on to fulfill God's calling in his life. And the second great truth we learned about the calling is the compulsion of God's call. When he wanted to quit, when he wanted to give up, when he said, it's too difficult, he said, I'm not going to do this anymore. But then something happened, the inner compulsion of God's call. Now, many people ask me a lot about how do I know God's call on my life? And there, there are a few signs you can look for, but here's the main one. It's what I call the inescapable call of God. When you cannot see yourself doing anything else in life but that one thing. When you know if you really wanted to be happy, you would do that one thing. That one thing is your calling. When you, you may have the ability to do other things, but what you really want to do, what you're driven to do, that one thing, that's your calling. And it's inescapable. It's always there. It's the one thing you've always dreamed of doing. You can see yourself doing. You're fulfilled in doing. And that's what happened to him. 
Yes, he was discouraged. Yes, he wanted to quit like all of us are at times, but there was this inner compulsion. He said, when, if I say I'm not going to mention his word anymore, can you imagine a minister saying he's not going to mention the word of God anymore? That's how low he is. Or I'm not going to speak anymore in his name. I'm tired of talking to people about God. That's what he's saying. But if I say that, even then, his word is in my heart like a fire. And he just doesn't mean the word. He means his calling to preach the word. He means the anointing God has given him, the calling God has given him. Whatever that calling is in your life, God has given it to you, and it is like a fire shut up in your bones. And that's my message this morning, fire in my bones. He said, I cannot hold it in. I cannot resist fulfilling my calling anymore. I cannot contain it anymore. There aren't enough people in life to prop you up to success. Encouragement is so important, and I appreciate all the people that encourage me. We all need it, but there are not enough people to prop us up to succeed. That success has got to come from within here. You have such an inner fire, a, such an inner drive, such an inner passion to accomplish what God has called you to accomplish that regardless of the pressure around you, that fire compels you from within that you're going to do the will of God regardless. That fire is a divine fire. It's an anointing. It's, a, it's an influence of the Holy Spirit. And what we need today is a fresh fire. That's the answer when you're down and you want to quit and you want to bail and you want to find another way. That is, the, that is the answer. You go back to the Lord and say, Lord, send me fresh fire. Rekindle that fire until that fire overcomes my discouragement. You see, fire purifies. And this spiritual fire will consume that discouragement. It'll burn it all up and consume it so it no longer consumes you. Fire is passion. It'll give you a passion for life again. It'll give you a passion for your marriage again. It'll give you a passion for your kids and for your work and your career. That spiritual fire will reawaken your passion for life, and it'll give you power. It'll give you the ability to overcome all of the discouragement that you feel right now. You'll feel new energy and new strength when the fire of the Holy Spirit is strong in your life. You know, when Malachi talked about the Savior coming, the Messiah, he said it this way in Malachi 3 and 2. He will come like a refiner's fire. In fact, Jesus said he'd come to bring fire. And that's what he needs to do in this sanctuary this morning. He needs to fulfill John, Luke chapter 17, like Luke chapter 12, verse 49. He said, I've come to kindle a fire on the earth. My prayer is that the Lord Jesus would come in this room now and kindle a fire in some of us that are down and depressed. We want to give up. Let the fire of God burn within us again. When John the Baptist introduced Jesus to the world, he said he's going to come and bring something. Matthew 3, 11, John said, I baptize you with the water for repentance, but he that comes after me is greater than I whose shoes I'm not worthy to untie. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And when you're down and you feel like quitting, you just need to say, Lord, baptize me today with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Because that fire is greater in you than the pressure around you. And that's what Jeremiah felt, and that's what brought him out of his discouragement. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, don't put out the Spirit's fire. When the early believers prayed on the day of Pentecost before they preached anything, the Scripture says something happened to them, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly there came the sound from heaven like the blowing of a violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And suddenly there appeared to them flames of fire that rested on each one of them. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 and 28, our God is a consuming fire. And you can ask for that God who is a consuming fire to burn up your discouragement and your hopelessness and your disappointment in life, and he will reawaken in you a passion for life and reignite your calling. In downtown Minneapolis, Several years ago, there was a, a church, an older church, that caught fire, and it burned to the ground quickly. It didn't have modern materials, a lot of wood. And the only thing left standing were some of the old stone walls, just a pile of rubble, charred wood. But that sanctuary had in it an, a beautiful statue. It was a replica of Thor Walden's statue that's entitled The Appealing Christ, where Jesus is standing, and he's looking down at the world, and he has his arms outstretched. And the next morning when that church burned down that night, still sitting in that pile of rubble, people that were going to work downtown noticed the church had burned down. 
and the rubble, the burned wood, and yet that beautiful statue of Jesus standing in the middle of all of that ruin with his arms outstretched. And the wreckage of the church almost made the image of Jesus even more pronounced. Some people stopped and took pictures of it and got in the news. For several weeks, people came and just visited the site and took pictures. Some people even stopped there and prayed. They found it a very inspiring moment. What a metaphor. That beautiful picture of Jesus, that image, had been in that sanctuary for years. And the only people that could ever see that beauty were the people that came in that sanctuary. But when that church caught on fire, then the world saw Jesus. And what we need is a fresh fire of the Holy Spirit to come on us so the world can see Christ in us, the hope of glory. So what's the answer out of my discouragement? I'm down. Things aren't working out. A fresh fire of the Spirit. People around you cannot get you out of that place by themselves. You need something within you. His word, his calling, his anointing is in my body, my flesh, my bones, he said, like a fire shut up in my bones. I cannot keep it any longer. I've got to fulfill my destiny, he said. Ask God today for the fresh fire of the Holy Spirit in your heart as I do. That's what we need to purify out these feelings of oppression and discouragement and hopelessness, to reawaken our passion for God and our passion for life and to give us the power we need to do what God has called us to do. And that's what brought him out. It brought him to a new sense of confidence. At the end, he says, but the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. Why don't you say that with me? The Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will not overcome me. They'll not prevail. You know what I like about Jeremiah is the fact that he didn't spend too much time here at this low point. I'm glad this complaint part is pretty brief. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. I mean, he is mad with God. He is so mad and disappointed in God, he calls God a liar. And that's about as angry as you can get. You misled me. You weren't honest with me. That's how upset he is with God. But I like the fact that he doesn't stay there too long. I'm ridiculed. I'm mocked. But he didn't stay there too long. He didn't dwell too long on how hard he had it. And I see a lot of people doing that today. They're staying mad way too long. They're brooding over injustice. They're brooding over unfairness. They're brooding over what they've been through. They're staying at that place way too long. And it's robbing them of their joy and their potential and their giftedness. Jeremiah quickly got out of that place. He didn't brood too long in self-pity. He felt sorry for himself. And we all feel that way. But he didn't stay there too long. You don't want to stay there too long. You don't want to linger at that place. He got in touch with that word that was in him. He said, I'm not going to hold it in anymore. I'm going to get back in the game. I'm going to fulfill my calling. And then he came to this whole new confidence. He lost all confidence. Now it comes back to him. The fire of the Spirit touched him again. He said, the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. His mind, instead of dwelling on the difficulty he had, he started going back to what God said to him in the very beginning when he called him. He thought of that, and it brought him out of his discouragement. And what did the Lord say to Jeremiah when he first called him? Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. This is what I think Jeremiah began to think about when the Lord said to him, Jeremiah, get yourself ready. Everybody say that. Get yourself ready. Stand up, he said, and speak everything I command you to speak. Do not be terrified of them or I will terrify you before them. They will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand up against the whole land. I am with you, says the Lord, and I will rescue you. Suddenly, Jeremiah realized the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. Think about that. The God of battles is with you. God will fight your battle for you and with you. God has made you to be a fortified city. You're not weak. You're a fortified city. You're not weak. You're an iron pillar. God has made you a bronze wall to stand up against all the pressure of life and to do what God has ordained you to do. The Lord is with you like a mighty warrior. Make his confidence came right back. 
when the fresh fire of the Holy Spirit burned within him, fire shut up in my bones. People today are talking about how difficult our days are, how the world's changing rapidly. But you know, Jeremiah lived in very difficult times too. It was difficult for him to be a voice for God in his generation. He was ridiculed and mocked. And we're living in that kind of a culture today. Our children no longer have any teaching of biblical truth anywhere. Not in any institution, not in the school, not from the government, not from television, not from social media, because it's politically incorrect now. The only place you're getting any solid Christian teaching is at home or the church. Difficult days. It's difficult for Jeremiah, but this is our generation. This is our time. God sends us out into this world. He says, get yourself ready for this world. It's not like it used to be. It's what it is. This is our time. This is our generation. Get yourself ready. Speak what I tell you to speak, God says to us. Stand up against the whole land. The church of Jesus Christ is a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall. And the Lord is with us like a mighty warrior. In the 1800s, there was a man named Wendell Phillips. He was a great orator, a tremendous public speaker. He was also a champion of the abolishment of slavery in the United States, an abolitionist, which was abolished in 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation. And then later the Constitution ratified. The people that worked to abolish slavery in, the Amer in America in the early 1800s were called abolitionists. And he was one of them. He was an outspoken champion. In his later years, he was in conversation with a young man. And he began to reflect upon what he had been through and the great victory that they had won in the abolition of slavery in the United States. The transformation of American life and law begin to reflect on a lot of those stories and experiences that he had. This young man just sat captivated listening to him. He said, Mr. Phillips, he said, if I had lived in your day, I would have been a hero just like you. And Wendell Phillips says, you are alive in my day. And this is God's day. Be a hero now. This world is what it is. And American culture and life is changing. Be a Christian now. God will send a revival in our generation. Would you stand with me this morning and pray? I just want to lift my hands toward heaven and ask for fresh fire. That's what I want to ask for. You need your discouragement burned out of your heart. You lost your joy. If you lost your passion for life, for the things of God, if you lost your passion for your marriage, you're just so down about it. You feel like you can't go on. You feel like you have no energy. It comes from within. It comes from within. That's the Spirit of the Lord. He can give you that. Like He did Jeremiah, He can give you an inner fire that's greater than the pressure you're dealing with. Just lift your hands toward heaven with me for a moment and ask him, Lord Jesus, baptize us today with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Ignite fresh fire within our souls today. Burn up, Lord, the discouragement that we have felt, the feeling like quitting. Burn that up and give us new passion, Lord, for you, for the things of God for our family, for our, for our marriage. Give us new passion today, the fire of the Holy Spirit. Give us power, Lord. We don't have strength in ourselves to fight some of these battles or to take on these challenges, but you can give us the power of the Spirit, and we ask you for the fire of the Holy Spirit today. Lord, send the fire of God in my heart today. In Jesus' name.
in Jesus' name. These are the last days, says the Spirit of God, but I will visit you once again and pour out my grace and power upon you. I, the Lord, consecrate you and commission you as my witnesses, bearers of my word in your generation, and you shall see my promises fulfilled in your life says the Lord of hosts. Let's receive the prophetic gift of the Holy Spirit today. Personally receive it. Lord, I receive your word today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.